Thanks. All right. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today, virtually, of course. Uh, we hope you've been enjoying Pollinator Week. Uh, it's been a very exciting week for us, of course. And if you haven't tuned into our social media, we've been posting about different groups of pollinators every day this week. Uh, and today is B Day, so very fitting that we're having this talk today. So hopefully you can check that out. Just a reminder again that this is being recorded and it will be posted later. Uh, we can send out details on where that will be. So if you happen to need to leave early or have a friend who couldn't join, uh, there will be a link later that you can access. So just before we get started, uh, we'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement. Since this program is being held virtually, a singular land acknowledgement does not capture all of our locations. As a result, I'm going to share the Guelph Region Acknowledgement, since this is where Wildlife Preservation Canada is headquartered. But I also invite everyone to consider their own position with regards to the land on which they find themselves. Guelph, Ontario is situated on the homelands of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Attawandaran peoples and on the treaty lands of the Mississauga of the Credit First Nation. However, our teams work across Turtle Island and we recognize the diversity of Indigenous peoples who have, who have and continue to steward these lands. As those involved in species conservation, our natural lands and the animals within them are so important to us. This recognition is a reflection of our commitment to listening to and cherishing the traditional knowledge that Indigenous people have of our species and our commitment to ensuring our efforts are holistic and inclusive of all ways of knowing. So thank you for joining me in that. So just an introduction. Um, so my name is Tiffany. I am the Conservation Outreach and Field Biologist. I work under the Native Pollinator Initiative of Wildlife Preservation Canada. So I will be one of your hosts today. With me is Ellen. Uh, she Hello. is our bumblebee conservation technician. So she works primarily for the bumblebee, or cons uh, bumblebee recovery program. So that's also under the Native Pollinator Initiative. If you're not familiar with Wildlife Preservation Canada, uh, so we're the ones hosting the webinar today. So we're a nationwide nonprofit um, with the mission statement of saving animal species at risk with direct hands on intervention. And we have various uh, animal programs across Ontario and BC. So again, we really thank you for joining to us and we're really excited to have Lawrence here today. Uh, so just a reminder, so you've all been muted upon entry and if you could stay that way, that would be great until we at least get to the question period. Questions will go into the chat box, which you'll see in the bottom, um, on the bottom kind of sidebar there. Um, we won't be answering any questions until the end, but if you need to put them in the chat beforehand, Ellen will be helping moderate the chat. Um, I already mentioned staying muted, it's being recorded. So I think we've got all that. So now getting into Lawrence, we're super excited to have Lawrence join us today. So Dr. Lawrence Tucker is a distinguished research professor in the biology department at York University. His research focuses on bee systematics, phylogeny, taxonomy, including DNA barcoding and biogeography. He was also a founding member of the Center for Bee Ecology, Evolution and Conservation at York University. Dr. Packer is a world-renowned bee expert and has the largest Canadian collection of bees from all around the globe, which is estimated to have over 300,000 specimens. He has published over 160 research articles and two, book, two books, sorry, with a third in preparation. And he and his students have described almost 200 new species and two new genera of bees. So we're incredibly grateful to have him join us today. Um, and we hope you really enjoy the presentation uh, that we've that he will be bringing to you today. So thanks so much, Lawrence, and on to you. Well, thanks very much for that introduction. Thanks very much for the, uh, the offer to give this talk on these important and gorgeous organisms on their day in Pollinator Week. So I'm going to be talking about bee diversity. Um, uh -huh. So um, this is an outline of what the talk's going to uh, be about. It's largely going to be image driven um, and the reason for this is bees are just so gorgeous and the reason I got interested in them in the first place isn't that they isn't because they're important because 40 years ago they weren't or people didn't realize they were. Um, but I got interested in them for aesthetic reasons so I'll be showing you lots of pictures of bees and then I'll talk a little bit about various aspects of their biology. Now I noticed on uh, one of the whoops, one of the posters that was put out about this, I was listed as being a renowned bumblebee expert. Um, sorry for those of you that like bumblebees, I am not a renowned bumblebee expert, and I also don't look at honeybees either. 
Um, I made that decision very early in my career, 40 odd years ago. Um, and I, there are very good reasons for this. So what I did yesterday was to do a scopus search for the number of papers that have been published with honeybee in the title abstract or keyword. And in less than six months of this year, over 1,100 papers have been published on honeybees. Uh, that same number for bumblebees was 230. And for all other bees, it was only 93. I mean, that's still one research article every two days, but you'd be horrified how little time I have to actually read things. Um, but when we look at this in terms of the number of species in each of these groups, most of the papers on honeybees were just on one species, the Western domesticated honeybee Apis mellifera. Uh, there are 280 plus bumblebee species, so they get almost one paper each on average in the first six months of the year. And then there's over 20,000 uh, other bee species to share the 93 research papers amongst themselves. So a main reason for me not knowing much at all about honeybees and bumblebees is that there is far too much to know about them and far too many other people far better at it than I am. Okay, so uh, bee color. Bees come in all the possible colors. This is a red uh, masked bee from Australia, subgenus Rhodo hylaeus. Um, this is an orange Andrina, a solitary mining bee from the Middle East. Uh, here we see a bee that's almost all yellow. Quite a few bees are almost all yellow. Most of them are very small um, and they can be difficult to find on yellowish flowers. Uh, we get green bees like this. This is a cuckoo orchid bee. In other words, it lays its eggs in the nests of other orchid bee species rather than collecting its own pollen and nectar. That's a really rather lovely green. And then there's the other genus of cuckoo orchid bee, Aglae. And as the species name suggests, Cerulea, it's a lovely blue insect with nice dark wings. And then an honest orchid bee. This is a purple uh, euphrasia, purplish euphrasia. So we get bees, all the colors of the rainbow. And some bees have got most of these colors on as single individuals. So here you can see there's yellow, orange, red, green, a bit of blue. Can't really see any purple on this one, but it's got all the others. And then this one here has got yellow, orange, green, purple and blue, doesn't have much in the way of red there. Um, but there's lots of bees that have evolved these bright metallic colorations. So another thing we should note perhaps is that this is also Pride Week. And so the bees can celebrate both Pollinator Week and Pride Week simultaneously with their gorgeous colors. Okay, of course, some bees are white, uh, especially uh, white haired. Um, although many of them become like older people, uh, they might start off with darker colored hair and then go silvery gray or white as they get older. But this, as we can see by the wing margins, the wing margins are intact. So this is actually quite a young bee when it was photographed uh, and it's got lovely white hair sticking out all over its body. Um, here we see a bee that's uh, almost entirely black and as often is the case with things that are that color they get n devilish names so this one is called Megascurtetica mephistophelica named after mephistopheles generally thought to be a bad guy okay so bees also vary obviously in shape this is perhaps the longest and narrowest bee uh, we can see the tongue there is almost as long as the entire body. Uh, its head is ridiculously long, uh, almost as long as the thorax. Uh, really remarkably weird uh, bee from uh, the deserts in Chile. And this is um, an African anthidiine bee, which is really rather fat, uh, short and fat. Uh, this is one that Sam Drogi uh, called a Sputnik bee. Um, because of its similarity to early spacecraft. 
Um, many bees have got very strange adaptations uh, for mating in the males. Presumably these are things sexually selected by females. So this is a pseudapis bee. One of the defining characteristics in both sexes of, of this is this enlarged tegula here. The tegula is like a kneecap to the wing. In most bees, it's a, about a third the size of this, but for some reason in this genus, they've got it remarkably enlarged. I'd like to point out these interestingly flattened and dark apical segments to the mid tarsus of this bee. Um, and these are used less semaphore signaling. Presumably this is something that the females like to see. And it's quite interesting that in this genus, there are two different ways in which the males achieve this, either by having this last tarsal segment flattened and disc shaped, or by having it normal and thin, but covered in on each side with a row of black bristles that gives the same effect. So this then looks as if initially the females had some kind of uh, makeup that meant that they liked the idea of males signaling to them with black markings at the end of their middle legs. And then the males evolved two different ways of achieving that. Uh, look at the hind leg here. There's a spine on the trochanter here, a massively expanded uh, hind femur, and then this hugely weird hind tibia. And different species in this genus, the males have got different shapes, particularly to the uh, hind tibia. I'd also like to point out these strange hairs here. Um, and these are present in different sizes, shapes, and positions in different species. Uh, again, it's the males that have these. This one's got them just under the mid femur. Some of them have got them underneath the thorax also. So this is an interesting example of kind of extreme sexual selection. Uh, in bees where many of the body parts have been modified, presumably because that's what the females like. Uh, some bees look a little bit more like scorpions than you might imagine. Uh, this is a species I described a couple of years ago, uh, Bronze Apis scorpio. It is a cuckoo uh, allodapine bee. In other words, it doesn't uh, forage for itself, but lays its eggs in the nests of its close relatives, which are in, probably in the same genus, although nobody's ever found a nest with this in. Uh, some bees are spectacularly long antennae. Uh, this one here might be the record though, Tinea shelis gorii, um, quite a rare bee, spectacularly beautiful. And look at that uh, enormous great long antenna there. I, 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 call this one the devil's coach whip bee. Um, it is another one of these cuckoo bees, so we might consider them as being a little devilish in their behavior. Uh, at the other extreme, we've got a bee with all really short antennae like this one. This is uh, in fact related to the bronze apis I showed you a little while ago. This is a macrogalia male, and these seem to hang out in the nests and are hardly ever found. Um, it's such an unusual bee, considering it's meant to have a long tongue, because it's in the family Apidae. Those of you that know about uh, bee taxonomy will realize Apidae are meant to be long tongue bees, and it's got almost no mouth parts at all. Uh, it gets its food in the nest that it's hanging out in. Um, it took me a, quite a while to figure out what this was when it was sent to me uh, by a friend of mine from Kenya uh, 10 years ago. Uh, bees vary in size. Uh, this is, I posted this uh, as an April Fool's Day joke once. Um, this isn't a picture of living bees. This is uh, specimens arranged particularly to make it look as if one bee is stealing the nectar from the tongue of another. Uh, to my knowledge, that doesn't happen. Uh, but the smallest bee is about half the size of this one here. And the largest bee is a lot bigger than the one we see on the left. Uh, so this is, in fact, a picture of the smallest bee, or the equal smallest bee. This is Perdida minima, which you can find in southern Arizona and nearby desert areas. They nest in the ground. This isn't the largest bee, but it is a large one. This is a large carpenter bee, um, again, also from the U.S. southwest. Now, the largest bee is, in terms of length anyway, if not maybe weight, because it's a fairly narrow one, is this, uh, it's Megachile Pluto. 
Um, this is the size of it in relation to a honeybee. So we can see the head of this bee is about the size of a honeybee. So this is a whomping great big bee. This is a, a friend of mine, Eli Wyman, who rediscovered this species. Um, this is, uh, it's called Wallace's giant resin bee because the first specimen ever found was collected by Alfred Russell Wallace in the 1850s. So this bee that you see here, it's a picture of a specimen that's uh, 160 odd years old. Uh, I'm not going to be in such good shape when I'm 160 years old. Uh, this bee was photographed, uh, is kept at the Hope Department of Entomology in, in Oxford. A beautiful large bee with massive great big mandibles, and it uses these mandibles to get resins from uh, plants, and then it makes a ball of resin which is held in place by the mandibles and the labrum here, this enormous labrum on the face of the bee, that so carries a ball of uh, resin to a termite nest and it makes a burrow inside the termite's nest and it lines its brood cells with resin. Uh, fantastic thing. Um, it was thought to be extinct for a long time because nobody went to where it was collected, although in fact there were a few specimens sitting around in museums that people hadn't noticed. Um, and then it was rediscovered by uh, somebody in 1981 and then just last year or maybe the year before uh, there was lots of media coverage because Eli and his buddies uh, found it again. It hadn't been seen for 35 years, you know, thought extinct. Well, if you don't look for something, you aren't going to find it. Um, so it was there all along, uh, but not many people were looking for it. So this is at least the longest bee, and it's pretty spectacular. And I've enjoyed spending the last couple of minutes explaining its story to you. Okay, bee food. Uh, we all know that bees collect pollen, and pollen is the food that they feed, uh, that their larvae eat, uh, pollen and nectar for most bees. Uh, female bees need pollen um, to help them develop their eggs, and so the adult bees need pollen also, and they need nectar as an energy source for themselves. Um, Many bees feed on a wide range of different uh, floral hosts, but some of them are much more specialized. Uh, and what we can see here is a bee called Lasia glossum enotherae. And this is a bee which um, is active now here in Southern Ontario. If you've got sun drops in your garden and you get up early in the morning, you might be able to see it. Um, so this bee, uh, has got a very unusual way of getting at the pollen because Enothera uh, plants make pollen that is held together by spider web like threads. And so these bees, if they can be the first one to get into the flower, they can rake out all of the pollen, all of the pollen from the flower, but they have to be the first one there. If they're the second one there, there's nothing left which is why these bees are active as soon as it's light enough for them to see their way around. And they force their way even into unopened flowers. And here we see the lucky female um, that's gonna get all of the booty from this one plant. These bees only visit, uh, at this, this species only visits a few species of uh, Enothera and nothing else. So some bees forage at night. Um, this is a nocturnal bee, uh, and you can. One of the things that helps us understand that is that it's got these very large ocelli, these measured light intensity, and it's also got very large eyes. So these bees have been studied uh, uh, in the wild, and some nocturnal bees can actually see colors in the dark um, when there's no more light in the sky than what you get from the stars. Um, some of them uh, are easier to find in a moonlit night uh, because they have difficulty finding their way around, and so um, they actually have diff uh, so they actually prefer to fly around on nights uh, when when there's a lot of moonlight. But these bees can find their nest, which is a twig, um, in Central America. Um, they can fly around foraging and then find their way back to the nest. If there's a bit of moonlight around, they find their way back to the nest more quickly. Okay, so let's see if we can get this 
uh, video going. It's coming up rather slow. Okay, here we go. Um, look at the abdomen of this bee. It's all black. There's no pollen on it. Now it's buzzing the flower. I hope you can hear that. And you can see maybe you saw clouds of pollen coming out from that flower. Um, but the abdomen that initially was all black with, uh, with no pollen on it has now got a lot of pollen on it. So most bees don't do this, although the ability to buzz pollinate flowers has originated independently many times in all major groups of bees. Uh, most bees get their pollen by scraping it directly with their legs. Sometimes they nibble at it with their mandibles to loosen it. Um, and then they carry the pollen back to the nest on their legs or on the underside of their abdomen. Um, but bees that buzz pollinate uh, plants, um, they, the pollen shoots out, as we can see in this picture here, against a black light. Here's the pollen zooming out of the anthers of this uh, relative of a tomato. Um, and uh, so then the pollen collects on the fur on their bodies and then they have to scrape it into the pollen carrying apparatus, which is referred to as a scoper, which in bumblebees is on the hind legs. And it's a corbicular, which means it's a bare patch surrounded by a basket that keeps the pollen in place. Uh, honeybees can't do this. Uh, if you like blueberries, you have to thank bees that aren't honeybees most of the time. Uh, honeybees can't do this, but if you've got tens of thousands of individuals each doing a bad job, maybe you get some blueberry crop. But most of the pollination of blueberries, which is much more effectively done by buzz pollination, is done by bumblebees and other, uh, we'll call them solitary bees. Okay, so pollen comes in all sorts of different shapes and sizes, really rather beautiful. And it was long thought to be the main protein source for bees until relatively recently, uh, when it was discovered that a large proportion of the nutrients that bees get from the pollen ball that their mother makes comes from microbes that are living in the pollen ball. And so it's like they're, they're grazing, as well as eating the pollen, the bee larvae are getting uh, lots of nutrients from the microbes um, that are sitting around inside the pollen ball. Um, and we can see this, uh, you know, their desire for uh, what isn't the pollen or nectar in this video here. Let's see if I can get this one going. So this is the larva of a stingless bee. They're related to honeybees. And it's got fungi growing around the edge of its brood cell. And you can see, this is a sped up video, you can see that it's preferentially eating that uh, rather than the pollen and nectar that it's swimming around in. And so this bee is showing just how important uh, microbes are, uh, non-pollen, non-nectar, yeah, in the food of developing bees. Um, in the tropics of the New World, there are a few species of also stingless bees that get the protein they need from dead animals. Um, this is a dead toad that is being fed on by a vulture bee. And so what these bees are doing is chewing away at the, um, at the stingless bee. Um, so chewing away at the, at the toad, and then they're gonna turn those nutrients into glandular secretions, which get fed to their nest mates back at home. And then recent, relatively recently, Hans Banziger discovered that there's a group of bees, again, stingless bees from the uh, old world tropics, from tropical Asia, that seem to get the proteins they need from antibacterial enzymes in vertebrate tears. So Hans Benziger has the most photographed eyeball in all of melatology. Here's one picture, here's another. Um, the bee with the arrow in the bottom left here, this one visited his eyeball dozens of times over a couple of days. Uh, you know, he, he actually had a mirror in front of him so he could put dots of paint on different individuals so he could know some of these bees individually and count how many times they were visiting his eye. Uh, he said that it only became painful if there were 20 of them feeding at once. 
it's not just human eyeballs. Um, um, here we see a, a crested hawk eagle uh, from India with the, with uh, with stingless bees feeding at uh, at the tears um, on its, I guess, left eyeball. Um, most bees, however, do feed on pollen and nectar uh, as larvae and as adults. But there are some bees that collect oils instead of nectar as a carbohydrate source for their offspring. This is a long-legged bee from, uh, from South Africa. And these collect oils in specially structured uh, mopping pads at the end of these really long front legs. And what they do is they fly around with these front legs folded and they land on a flower that's got really deep spurs with oil at the end of them. And they fly around and then as soon as they land on the plant, uh, these front legs are going deep into those spurs and they do it so fast, I have no idea how they manage it. Um, it's a bit like being able to jump into a sweater or a jacket um, without actually having to struggle your way through to get your arms into the sleeves. And there's something special about this. Um, some bees have got remarkably modified mouth parts to enable them to get at the nectar, the food that uh, uh, they that they need to fly, to to fuel their own activities and as nectar for their offspring. This is Zera Melissa Rosini, uh, named after Jerry Rosen of the American Museum of Natural History, who turned 92 this year and is still publishing on bees. Maybe there's some hope for me, although I think if I live that to be that old, I'll die of shock. Um, so here we see remarkable long mouth parts here. And this is the only bee in the world that I know of where it's got a furrow in the thorax, which you can see here, and then bristles to hold the tongue in place so it doesn't drool while it's flying around. It's a remarkable thing. Uh, look at this. I'm highlighting this particular structure here. And the reason for that is when I found this bee, which I showed you a picture of earlier, um, I immediately knew it was a close relative of this one because it looks so similar. Uh, it actually isn't that close a relative. It's in the same subfamily, but the common ancestor of those two bees will have a round head, not a ridiculous long face like this one. The part that is highlighted here in this one is just this tiny bit here. So here we've got an example of bees that have adapted to get nectar from very deep flowers. Um, they're desert bees, and if you're a flower producing energetically expensive nectar in a very arid place, you want to hide your nectar. And so they do this in, in deep nectaries. And so these two different groups of bees, or these two different species of bees, evolve completely different morphological adaptations to get at that nectar deep in the flower. And then orchid bees, look at the tongue on this one. This, this is, you know, the actual glosser. The parts I highlighted in uh, in the previous two pictures, you can't see because they're too small and they're back down here. So this is an orchid bee that's collecting nectar from really deep orchid flowers. Okay, so most bees don't make honey. Honeybees make honey, bumblebees make a tablespoon or so. Stingless honeybees uh, might make enough for you to uh, get from a stingless beehive. And if you get the opportunity to taste stingless bee honey, I strongly recommend it. It's absolutely delicious. Um, and then most bees don't nest in hives. Most of them, in fact, nest in the ground. Each of these brown spots you see here is the dirt kicked up at the nest entrance by a female bee digging into the ground. Uh, most that don't nest in the ground nest in stems, uh, beetle burrows in wood or other similar characters. Uh, some bees have been found in, nesting in the fuel lines of downed aircraft, uh, but they were found not guilty because they actually started nesting there bef after the plane crashed rather than before. Um, most bees will line their brood cell in the soil with the waterproofing uh waxy secretion for oily secretion some bees actually use oils from flowers to do this here we see a pollen ball with a larva on top 
Uh, some bees make their nests in snail shells. Here we see the pollen that a female uh, collected. There's the larva that's eaten most of the pollen, um, and, but the female defended its uh, youth uh, by filling the rest of the snail shell with gravel. Uh, here we see a female that's filling the entrance of a snail shell with chewed up plant material. And here we see a really diligent mother. She's produced pollen and eggs inside the snail shell. And now she's hiding the snail shell uh, with dead stems. Here we see uh, an anthidion nest of resin on the outside. Some of them will do this on a, on a rock. Um, some of them will do it on a plant. Uh, and so here we see uh, that this one has not only made the nest uh, with resin, but it's, it's made a mosaic of gravel um, to make it, presumably to make it even more difficult for natural enemies to find their way in. Uh, this is a bee that is common in all of the world's continents, I think, even in Australia now. Uh, not Antarctica, there are no bees there. It's the wool carder bee. Uh, originally, this is a European species, but it's traveled around the world as a result of human activity. It's called a wool carder bee because it shaves hairs from hairy leaves like this one here. Uh, and you can actually hear them doing this as they're chopping away, uh, shaving the, leaf, uh, the, the hairs off the leaves. And they make a ball that they carry back to their nest. And what a lovely mother this is. They actually make a, a, a hole in a giant pillow um, where they put pollen and nectar for their offspring. So you know, this mother lets its offspring grow up inside a nice fluffy pillow. How cool is that? Some bees line their nests with uh, leaf material. Uh, leaf cutter bees are particularly good at that. Uh, some of them have decided to go for something more colorful and go for petals. So here we can see different colored petals from different species of plants that have been used to line uh, the brood cell of this uh, particular species. And then a few years ago, Scott McIver, a student in my, he was working in my lab at the time, um, he found uh, a, a leaf cutter bee that was not only cutting leaves, but also pieces of plastic bag um, to line its brood cells with. He also found a resin bee that was using kitchen tile caulking instead of uh, resin from plants to line its nests. So that's uh, pretty, pretty cool stuff. Um, many bees are cuckoo bees. They don't work hard, like the archetypal hard-working, busy as a bee. They lay their eggs inside the nests of other bees. A lot of these are very wasp-like. If you see something like this flying around in spring over an earthen bank, it's probably looking for solitary mining bees uh, to lay its eggs inside its nest. Um, oops, some of these bees have to have special modifications to enable them to access the food for their larva. Uh, so here we see a Celioxis. This is uh, a bee that lays its eggs inside the nest, uh, leaf cutter bees. And this is the apex of the abdomen, which is like a knife. And so it slices through the leaf or the resin-like structure that lines the brood cells made by the host bee and lays its egg. Um, through the apex of the abdomen there. And then there are some other bees that, so that, that use different methods. So here we see an Epiolus, um, and this, these bees lay eggs inside the nests of Calides bees, uh, which line their nests with cellophane. Um, and we can see that they've got these tooth-like structures uh, that they use to saw through the plastic. And here we see a relative of Epiolus, it's called Triepiolus, and it's got like a pair of uh, forceps. Uh, exactly how they use those, I don't know, but maybe it's involved in very precise placement of the egg inside the host nest. Most bees are solitary. Um, so here's a solitary bee. There's a nest entrance just beneath it. Here we see a stingless bee colony entrance. Um, from Africa, 
and these can have hundreds of individuals inside the nest. Here we see the giant honeybee from uh, tropical Asia with these nests that are on the outside of structures, not inside uh, a hollow structure that we associate with the normal honeybees. And these things are, you know, multiple workers thick on the outside of the nest so that they're extremely well defended. Um, bumblebees are well known as uh, social species, queens um, overwinter and start a nest by themselves in spring and then produce a brood of workers that help to produce uh, more workers and then males and the uh, next year's queens later in the year. Here we see a stingless bee queen. It looks a bit like a termite. Its abdomen is so fat and it cannot fly. Um, in this condition, but it's surrounded by a cortege of uh, workers that are much smaller and, as their name suggests, they do all the work. But there's lots of bees that are social with really different life cycles. So here we see on the right, this is a gee whiz a queen and its worker of a sweat bee. Right? Many of you will know Holictus. Um, it's a genus that's common it's throughout North America and Europe. Um, this has got the largest caste difference of any bee I'm aware of because the queen is twice the linear measurement of this worker here. So you can see it's double that length and you can get about that head width there. Now, if you think of that in terms of mass, right, you turn a linear measurement into volume, so you cube it. Uh, what that means then is that this worker is likely to weigh an eighth of what its mother weighed. And as most bees can replace themselves, get enough food to make a bee the similar size to them, with about eight or so pollen collecting trips, it's possible that this queen can produce a worker just by going foraging once. I suspect that's uh, an underestimate, though maybe twice. And then we get some bees with very small number of workers. This is Olga chlorella aurata, and at the northern edge of its range, uh, almost half the nests had no workers. In, this is at the time of year when you'd expect the colony to be largest. Some of them had one worker and a few of them had two. So the average numbers, number of workers was about a half, and that's the maximum for this population. In other populations further south where the summer is longer, uh, all nests will have workers and maybe half a dozen of them. But here we've got a social bee where some individuals in the, in, the, in the population are entirely solitary, but others do have one or two workers. And then there's this strange thing, Lasia glossum marginatum, a European and Central Asian bee, the queens of which last for five or more years. They last twice as long as a honeybee queen. Um, so the colonies are started by one single female and then they make these turrets at the nest entrance and so a good aggregation of these looks like downtown Toronto with the one, uh, one or two year nests looking like a bungalow, uh, maybe a two or three year nest looking like a, a duplex, three or four stories and then the five and six year old nests with hundreds of bees flying in and out look like these little skyscrapers here. And here we can see a bee emerging from that entrance. It's a truly remarkably unusual beast. Okay, so very few bees make honey. Not many of them are social. Uh, almost none nest in hives. Lots of them are cuckoos that lay eggs in the nests of other bees. And the thing I didn't talk about was that, you know, lots of bees can't sting. No male bee can sting because the stings are modified egg laying apparatus. But even females of 15% of bees can't sting. So what are bees? Well, bees are vegetarian digger wasps. Here's a digger wasp. As you might expect, it's dug a hole. It's paralyzed a caterpillar. Here's a longhorn bee collecting pollen. One of the reasons many bees have lost the ability to sting is that their ancestral uh, waspy ancestors need the sting to paralyze the prey. Pollen doesn't need to be immobilized. So how do you tell whether something in your backyard is a bee or not? Bees have got branched hairs. Let wasps don't. Well, that's not very useful, is it? No. Uh, particularly not useful because some bees are bald. 
Um, and there are two reasons for bees being pretty bald. One is they carry the pollen and nectar home inside their digestive system rather than on the hairs of the body. Uh, the, the pollen, that is, you know, you're not going to carry nectar home on the surface of your body much. Um, and the cuckoo bees that don't do any of the pollen collecting. Um, so I had a great difficulty finding any branched hairs on this Australian Pachy uh, prosopis mirabilis. I'm sure it's got some somewhere, but I spent a fair bit of time looking and failed. And then we've got some velvet ants where they've got branched hairs here. So there are exceptions to everything. But if you've got things flying around in your garden and they are collecting pollen onto the body, onto their bodies, their hind legs, or the underneath the underside of the abdomen, that's a bee. Uh, telling mast bees and cuckoo bees and male bees takes a little bit more experience. So, which of these are bees and which of them are not bees? I'll give you a few seconds to work out the answer. I'll tell it and give you a hint. Six are bees and six are not bees. All right, so work out which ones you think are bees and which ones you think are not bees. And then you can uh, send a chat through if you got all of them right. Here's the answer. So this is a bee, this is a bee, that's a bee, that's a bee, that's a bee, and that's a bee. The, that's a fly, that's a wasp, that's a wasp, that's a fly, and that's another wasp. Okay, so I wonder how many of you got that right. Uh, my PhD students didn't get this 100% right when I tried it out on them. And this is a spectacularly wasp-like bee. It's one of these rel relatives of Epiolus that we looked at earlier. Okay, so bee diversity, uh, quickly, I'm gonna go through the bee families. Uh, there's seven of them. Um, the smallest one is the Stenotridae. There's only 21 species of these. Here we see representative examples of some of these. Uh, Stenotridae, you've got to go to Australia to see these. This is Australia's most spectacular bee, I think. Beautiful thing. Uh, Caledidae, these are the bees that make a cellophane lining to their brood cells. Um, as we can see here, uh, you can actually see the larva through the plastic. Uh, here we can see the, uh, the pollen and nectar, and there's an egg there. Um, and so because they literally put their offspring's food in a plastic bag, they can actually produce a very liquidy uh, food uh, for their offspring um, because it's not going to leak out. Uh, Andrenids, commonly known as solitary mining bees, over 3,000 species, and half of them are in one genus, uh, the genus Andrena, which is a bit of a nightmare for identification purposes, I can tell you. Uh, Halictid sweat bees, those of you in southern Ontario will have both of these in on the street you live on, I would bet. Um, if you see any bee that's green in the front, yellow and black at the back, that is an Agapostomum. And if it's got brown wings like this, it's Agapostomum splendens. So you can impress your friends with your knowledge of some ancient languages. Uh, Melitids, these include the long leg bees I looked at earlier. Meganomia, really large, fat uh, wasp like bees. We've only got three species of these and they're kind of relatively drab brown things compared to these ex examples. Um, Melidids are by far the most diverse on the African continent. Uh, Megachylids, leaf cutter bees, uh, resin bees, and uh, the wool cutter bees seen here, they particularly like purple flowers and you'll see males defending territories of purple flowers against all comers. Uh, Apides includes the honeybees, the bumblebees, also the orchid bees, which are attracted to baits. There's a half a dozen species here um, attracted to a bait, and they're called orchid bees because it's the males that go to orchids to collect fragrances, and they'll also collect other fragrances, and so you can actually attract them, as this biologist did here, by putting um, something they, that orchid bees like to uh, collect uh, onto a sheet of card or absorbent paper and hanging it up, hang it up in the jungles of South and, and Central America. 
Um, what the bees then do, with, what the orchid bee males then do with these fragrances is to store them in their hind legs, uh, expanded here, which is sponge-like on the inside. And the females prefer males with a complex bouquet. And this then has led to the strange situation where young male orchid bees will raid the perfume storage organs of recently dead uh, orchid bee males so that they can make its female think that they're more experienced than they actually are. Um, we're getting very close to the end now. So this is um, a map of where the bees are. Um, bee diversity is greatest as you go from yellow to dark colors. Bee diversity is greatest in the Southwest US, uh, some arid parts of Brazil. I'm not quite sure why there's so many species in the Democratic Republic of Congo, especially considering how difficult it is to work there. Uh, and there's a lot of bees in Australia. This is the way the world looks like if you make these different political areas the size that they are based upon their number of species of bees. It's pretty difficult to recognize uh, all of this. Uh, Australia's lost a lot of weight. Um, bees are found from sea level to way up in the mountains. Bee diversity is greatest in semi-arid areas, but even where it doesn't rain uh, or hardly ever rains, you can catch bees. There's a tiny white spot there, that's my car. And uh, I have a friend in Chile called Horacio Lorraine, and he would, uh, whenever there was unusual weather conditions, he'd drive around and try and find the oldest person in the neighborhood to tell him, you know, when was the last time this happened? And this hillside hadn't been green in 35 years. And so I spent five hours walking around here trying to catch bees. I caught three. Uh, even a patch of flowers in the middle of the desert like this, um, that I caught three species of bees, two of them undescribed uh, from this patch of a few flowers. Uh, bees get up to over 5,000 meters in, uh, in the Himalayas. Um, that's a discovery from uh, Paul Williams of the Natural History Museum in London. Um, other than bumblebees, the highest altitude bees have been found are about four and a half thousand meters. Uh, and this again is Northern Chile and I found an amphidium flying around at 4,200 meters. And they, they, these bees hover, which is the most energetically expensive form of uh, transport there is. And yet they're doing it in, a, in an atmosphere where there's so little oxygen, remarkable. Uh, and bees, yeah, get up into the mountains where there's lots of snow at times. And I've collected bees on the edge of a glacier in Nevada. Um, that was quite high up also. And then my final thoughts, you know, we all know bees are useful. You know, they meant to, you know, they help produce a third of the food that we eat that requires pollination, but really we should be loving them for their own beauty and the way that they inspire us. Um, this is Agonifa Dyke, who, or Dick, who is an artist who puts things inside bee hives, uh, honey bee hives, and then takes them out after some comb has been built on them. This is a friend of mine who did a mosaic of a rusty patch bumblebee. And this is uh, Nick Sweetman's artwork of an agapostum and splendens on, on a wall in downtown Toronto. Okay, so I need to thank lots of people that gave me images. Lots of organizations and a few people who've given me some research funding enabled me to do this. Lots of people have helped me in the field, and uh, those that helped me um, uh, it, with the bees I've shown images of are uh, shown here. And I thank you for listening to me for so long. Okay, that's it from me, but I will answer questions if there are any. I thank will try you. to answer questions. Thank you so much for that incredible talk. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, so as one of your hosts, I will be kind of um, going through the questions. I see one already, which is great. Um, if 
we have time to answer them all, we definitely will. If not, I have a dozen to ask you myself because that was very fascinating. Um, so I would say our first question is, is do the young of the nests where the cuckoo bees lay their eggs survive too, or are they killed in the process? That's a, that's a good question. So in some cases, the mother cuckoo bee will eat the egg that is on the pollen ball in the nest. Other times she leaves the uh, host egg or larva's death to her offspring. And so cuckoo bee embryological development is usually faster uh, than it is for the host. And so in, in some cases, the cuckoo bee actually lays its egg on top of the egg of the host. And so what happens is that the cuckoo bee larva cuts a hole in its own egg and then starts attacking, um, attacking the host egg even before it's come out of its own egg. It's a bit like eating breakfast in bed. Um, so uh, in some cases, the female kills um, kills the uh, host offspring herself. Sometimes their larvae do it. Uh, in the social parasites, um, usually they do let some of the host uh, uh, larvae continue and the colony will raise a mixture of, of cuckoo be, uh, of social parasites and, uh, and their own host's offspring. Good question. That was a good question. Um... I think I know the answer to this one from a different presentation, but what is your favorite bee and why? Well, it's so hard to make my mind up on that one. <laughs> um, and it changes over time. I think Zera Melissa Rosini has to be one of my favorites because its biology is so interesting and its structure is so weird. The other bee that I showed pictures of that kind of looked like it, I kind of like because I'm the only person to ever seen it ever seen it alive. Uh, I, I re remember when catching them and it was on the edge of the absolute desert in Chile and I was coming down and it was literally the last plant flowers uh, on the on, in the mountains before you get into an area where there is no vegetation. It's so dry and I found those there. But there's also this, let me see if I can get there. There's one I showed a picture of, that one's pretty good. Uh, let's see, uh, that one, that was on the, oops, that was on the coat, uh, oops, that yeah. was on the cover of my first book, which I don't seem to have a copy of at hand, um, so obviously I like that one. <laughs> um, someone asked, where can I find the short and fat ones? <laughs> um, the shortest and fattest bees I've ever seen, and, and actually the one I showed um, is, is not the record, um, but you have, you have to go to Africa to find those. South Africa and Kenya are the places I've seen them, um, and they're not very common. You, you know, you can often, you know, if you're collecting bees for a couple of weeks, you'll usually find a couple of them, but you rarely find more than a few uh, at a time. Although a, f a friend of mine in Malawi found males of a related species uh, sleeping together on twigs and uh, could catch quite a few at once. But those sites are few and far between. Mm. Okay, next one. I've watched flowers and seen two different bee species fight over a flower, even though there is one of the same type of flower right beside it. Why does this happen? Uh, oh, that's interesting. Um, so what the flowers might look the same to us, but they might look very different to the bees. Um, so what you might notice is that once a flower has been pollinated for a lot of different flowers, the color of the petals changes very often subtly. Um, so bees, you can sometimes see bees looking at flowers carefully they might be smelling whether another bee has already visited it earlier or they might be trying to judge the amount of pollen or nectar that is left there so the flowers might look the same to us but they might look differently from flower uh may, might look different and have different rewards from a bee's perspective or maybe you know that bee was just cranky 
So in that case, would it be, it would be them guarding it as a male so that a female would be able to access that resource? Like they're protecting uh, it from- uh, That's, okay, that's, yes, that does happen. Um, so like the, the Anthidium manicatum, the wall card be the males will defend a whole territory of flowers and will fight off anything that uh, wants to come in unless it's a female wall card be. Mm -hmm. um, but there are other males that will sit in a flower and mate with any female that comes to that flower if she will let him um, and those will defend their flowers um, against um, other males yeah mm -hmm. apart from planting native flowers what can homeowners do to help Canadian bees survive and thrive uh, my favorite recommendation is raspberries uh, for multiple reasons. Their flowers are really easy for bees to access the resources in because they're open, right? So the bees can get at the pollen really easily as opposed to something like um, a complicated rose where all the petals are um, like it's like a Russian doll. Maybe there's some food in the middle. Maybe there isn't. So, but it's not just the food. Ra old raspberry canes are an excellent nest site for bees that like to nest in twigs. And so I've got three, I've got four different genera of bees nesting in the old raspberry canes in my backyard. And of course, raspberries are kind of tasty, aren't they? So you get to. Uh, eat the fruits of the bees labors. Excellent. I have another interesting question. What do we know about the oils that melatids collect? Has there been much research on the different uses and applications? Okay, uh, that's something I don't know much about. Um, there has been quite a lot of work done on the chemical nature of the oils that these bees collect, but I, it's not a literature I have at the tip of my tongue. Um, but many of them do use it as a food source, as a carbohydrate source for their offspring. But some oil bees um, actually use the oils to line their brood cell or to actually cover the pollen ball. Some bees cover the pollen ball with oils so that the uh, so it doesn't dry out so much. So bees use these oils for a variety of different uh, reasons. Okay, which other bees um, are able to buzz pollinate other than bumblebees? Ooh, um, okay, so I grow tomatoes in my backyard and there's a, an, there's a bee called Anthophora terminalis. It looks like a small bumblebee. It's kind of dark and yellow brown black color with a little red mark at the end of its tail. This is one that you will find buzz pollinating making a very high pitched noise as it visits the tomato flowers. Um, there are in, in, all sorts of bees have evolved the ability to do this um, and the more people spend time in the field uh, watching this or looking out for it, you know, my hearing's getting a bit bad. I'm not likely to discover any new buzz pollinating bees in the future. But, uh, you know, there's an, an Andrina in uh, Peru, which I've found collecting nectar on flowers very commonly. And I thought, well, it's collecting pollen from these flowers too, until I heard one buzzing on a tomato flower or a, a relative of tomatoes. Uh, and then I read Jerry's paper on the subject. And yes, it doesn't collect uh, pollen from the same plants it collects nectar from. It collects pollen by buzz pollinating. Um, uh, some relatives of this bee here uh, do buzz pollination also. So it's something that's evolved many times. And I've actually, you know, there, there was a paper written on this by Sophie Cardinal and Steve Buckman uh, a couple of years ago, and they have a massive phylogeny of bees and they map onto the evolutionary tree, which is so, you know, it's so big, it has to be spherical. Otherwise you need a, you know, toilet paper, a roll of toilet paper to see all the branches on it. Um, and so it evolved dotted around the, the whole phylogeny. Mm. Okay, I think I had, I think we're good on that sense. I have one question of my own. I'm just trying to, you know what? Yeah, how do bees actually make cellophane? Like the Kalides. Okay, so that's uh, glandular secretions um, that come out of something called the um, 
are the dufous gland and they come out of um, the tail end of the bee. And one of the, a morphological defining characteristic of almost all colleddids and all females is that their tongue is, is broad and apically concave. And so uh, they use this uh, like a paintbrush. So the, so the mixture comes out of the tail end and then they paint it over the line, over the inside of their brood cells. Mm. And it comes out of a separate exit point of the abdomen other than the stinger, obviously. Uh, it would, well, okay, so the apex of the abdomen, T6, S6, um, the gap there, um, mm -hmm. but not through the, not the same place as the venom. Interesting. Very interesting. Um, oh, I have one more question. What is propolis? Oh my, I wish I had a better answer for this. It's... <laughs> Stuff collected by uh, honeybees and stingless honeybees that, that they use, um, I think, mean, mostly in nest construction. Um, I'm going to, interestingly enough, a friend of mine with tinnitus told me recently, like, for those of you who don't know, that that's a ringing in the ears and it's really annoying. And I've had it for over a year now, but he had real bad tinnitus and he started taking propolis pills and it went away after three weeks. Well, I've been taking tincture of propolis for a month and my ears are still ringing. So maybe he was lucky. Okay, I think Tiffany, oh, there we go. Um, Someone has said propolis is natural resinous mixture produced by honeybees from substances collected from parts of plants, buds, and egg suits. So it's a honeybee thing. So we're going to just... Yeah, uh, and, stingless, and stingless bees. And stingless bees. Okay. Yeah. I think Tiffany mentioned that I missed a question further up. I don't know if she wants to jump in and put that in. Yeah, I think there's one that just came in I'll do first. Uh, so someone asked, do bees specialize on certain flowers? Yeah, some, uh, some species do. Uh, there are some species of bees that will only collect nectar from one species of plant. Um, th there aren't many that are that specialized though. Um, in most cases, um, the bees are more specialized than the plants. So there aren't so many plants that need a particular bee to visit them. Um, but most bees will collect uh, pollen and pollen in particular, this is pollen that they specialize on usually from one or a few closely related species or a bunch of different genera or a whole family of flowers. The honeybees and some others are, you know, are completely diverse in their food choice and they'll collect pollen from almost anything. Um, so there's wide variation, um, but being really narrowly specialized on a single species of a plant is rare. But there are quite a few, like the uh, lazy glossum enothera bee that I showed you pictures of earlier, that will collect pollen from species in a single genus. I think I remember seeing a video once upon a time of uh, it, it might have been a bombus, I'm not sure, but there was a buzz pollination where the flower would only open to a certain frequency of buzz pollination. Like, not only did it have to be specifically buzz pollinated, but also a certain frequency. I don't know if you know the example I'm talking about or whether or not that was just. No, I, 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 I don't know that example. I, I'd, I'd like to find out more about that. That sounds pretty interesting. Hmm. Um, so yeah. Alfalfa, you know, one of the things I often say in, in general talks is that, you know, you have to like bees even if you don't eat fruits and vegetables, because in Canada, 15% of beef and dairy is the result of pollinators pollinating alfalfa, which is winter fodder for cattle in some parts of the country. Um, and alfalfa is another one of these plants, which is really poorly pollinated by honeybees, but is perfectly pollinated by a bee, a leaf cutter bee called the alfalfa leaf cutter bee, which knows exactly how to trip the flowers so that the, uh, so that the pollen, uh, and so the anthers and stigma are open. Um, for pollination. Uh, and honeybees don't know how to do that. But again, you've got 10,000 individuals doing a lousy job. Uh, they'll, you'll get some pollination from honeybees with, uh, in, in alfalfa fields. But if all you need is a few uh, alfalfa leaf cutter bees, and you'll get a few individuals each doing a great job. Mm -hmm. 
so the one that was a bit further up, so this is a little bit more specific to an image I think you have in the presentation. It says, uh, what was the large bee pictured prior to the first long-legged bee image? It was visiting a Nolana species. If that happens to trigger uh, something there. <laughs> uh, is it, is it, have you stopped the screen? Uh... Yes, no, you can go, yeah, you can still slide. That's, uh, that's Corpolicana uh, fulvicollis, which is a bee you find along the coasts of central Chile. Uh, anybody that's planning on uh, going to Chile to see this bee, um, you can see them and their nests on the path from Los Villos to Punta del Lobos, which is the, the sea lion colony at the end of a little it's a little island just off the coast. And uh, as you get close to where the sea lions are, um, the, you, there's a lot of sand and you can see the males flying fast over the sand looking for females. Uh, and the males are out flying in the sun from dawn till dusk pretty much. And so their bright orange fades to pale brown very quickly. But a fresh female has got these lovely crisp orange black and white patterns to them. Gorgeous bees. Okay, I think we're we're going a little over. We appreciate your time. Um, if you want to squeeze in one more question, I think it's a follow up from the specialization question. Um, but it'll be the last question for today. Um, can a specialized bee survive on a plant that is not specialized for? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so one of the, I, I showed you lazy glossum enothera, uh, which only goes to enothera um, plants. There, one of its relatives also specializes on uh, enothera, but it was studied over multiple years. And, and one year, uh, there weren't enothera flowers for it to collect pollen from. So it did manage to eke out some uh, offspring production uh, by collecting pollen from a different plant. Now, there, is, there are some pollens that don't produce enough, um, uh, don't have a complete amino acid. Um, what's the word? Uh, they don't have all the, the essential amino acids for a bee. And so any larva that eats just that is going to starve um, unless it's got microbes in the pollen ball that will help make that amino acid from the other chemicals in the pollen and nectar. Uh, and so people have done experiments where they've transferred an egg from a pollen ball that's say just uh, buttercup, ranunculus, onto a pollen ball that's say just um, Blapper's bugloss. I can't remember the exact examples, um, but I know that the ranunculus example uh, the bee that can grow on that naturally collects pollen for it to survive, but the other related bee that doesn't feed on that normally, when that egg was transferred, the larvae uh, didn't develop to adulthood. And so the answer to that is sometimes. <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much for all of the beautiful photos. I learned a lot today and I've been studying entomology for seven plus years. So it's always a pleasure to to hear your amazing stories and thank you so much. I'm sure everyone else enjoyed it. I've seen lots of thank yous and lots of fantastic talks in the comments. Um, so it was much appreciated by, by everyone. Um, thank you so much for everyone coming out and we hope that you check out the rest of our posts on um, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, where we put lots of in, um, informational um, posts on other pollinators and other pollinator groups that are also important and are often underrated. Um, so go check those out as well if you haven't already. All right, well, thank you very much. As I can see on the list of people attending, there's some people that have got more important things to do with their lives, like studying Chilean and Peruvian plants. Um, anyway, so thank you all for coming. I hope you all had a good time. I'm now going off to get my second COVID-19 vaccine. So I encourage all of you to book yours in as soon as possible if you haven't had them already. Thank you very much. Thank you so much again, Lawrence. And just a reminder, everybody, the recording will go up probably within the next week or two, and that will be posted to um, probably our social media when that is up, if you'd like to go back over it again. So thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today, as well as Lawrence. And happy Pollinator Week, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you.
Thanks very much. And uh, please send me the link too. Bye for now.